Okay. <laughs> <We're live. laughs> okay. Um, hello, everyone. The fourth and final general education meeting, kind of. We'll keep going mm -hmm. over open rocket stuff, but this is the final like sub team overview thing. So um, yeah, we're avionics recovery. Um, basically, uh, what we do is we're the brains of the rocket. So the rocket goes up, the motor is stupid and doesn't know what's going on. None of the rocket knows what's going on. Avionics recovery, we know what's going on. So we basically schedule all the events of the rocket. Um, so before we get started, a quick overview of what we are as a team. Are we building missiles or rockets? We're building rockets because we have, <laughs> sorry? Yeah, well, that's a that's a Pac-3 missile. So it intercepts other missiles, it's super cool. Um, yeah, it's cool. I'm sure we have some out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, um, anyways, yeah, so basically the difference is if you've ever heard someone say rocket or someone say missile and you're like, what's the difference? Basically missiles have destructive payloads um, and we use rockets. So we have non-destructive payloads and our rockets are generally recoverable. Um, so avionics and recovery is basically the, the art of recovering the rocket once we send it up in the air, so everything that goes up has to come back down. Um, so just a general little flight profile of what all of our rocket launches look like. If you look over, I'm an annotator, I'm an annotator at heart. Um, so if you look over here, we have our little watch. Um, what happens is basically we have a little igniter inside the motor and it um, is activated by the pad, which is basically there's a little line here and then there's a guy on the pad, here's the pad here's the guy he's like he presses the go button um and then once we do that um our motor goes and then right about here the propellant will run out and the the rocket continues to coast upwards until it reaches its apogee up here which is basically the maximum height of the rocket at that point either two events happen um so for a more complex uh sort of deployment which we're gonna go into both deployment types, but for a more complex deployment, you would deploy a smaller chute first. And then once we reach a different altitude, we would do a main chute. Um, for less complex deployments, we would do just a main chute at Apogee. Um, and if you could kind of see from this distance here, th this distance is basically um, kind of, which is also a good summary about how far our rocket will drift. So as you can see with a less complex setup, where you're doing the main first and you don't have a drogue, you have to walk a lot longer to pick up your rocket. Um, and then for a more complex setup with the drogue and the main chute, you have to walk less. Uh, basically what the drogue chute does is makes it so the rocket isn't ballistic. Um, and then we deploy a main chute when we want to reach that uh, ground hit uh, velocity desired. Um, so yeah, basically drogue and then we do main. Oh my God, we have another person. Hey. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, um, yeah. So the consequences of this of this system that we've derived over years and years of rocketry is um, our ground hit velocity goes down when we deploy that main, so that's awesome. Um, our drift radius goes down, but there's a lot more chances of failure, um, which we'll go into. So let me clear all these drawings. Stop annotating. Okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, we'll basically just go into the main separation scheme of one of the more complex rockets. So this is um, the event at launch. Basically, the rocket is pointed straight up. Um, just for reference, here's our AV bay. We'll go more into that in a second. But it goes up, um, and then it coasts. And then at a certain point, it will um, reach its apogee, where it's approximately horizontal. Um, our actual deployment usually happens when it's a little bit less than horizontal. So the rocket will be pointed slightly down. Um, when we have our first ejection event. But basically at this point, there's a piece of electronics in the av avionics bay, which um, collects atmospheric pressure. And over time, um, it's basically saying, oh, the air tastes like I'm pretty high up. It tastes like I'm at a different altitude. And then eventually it's gonna be like, oh, this air tastes like I'm going down. So at that point, it shoots off your first charge. And then he has the tasty air, he says, okay, I'm going to send a signal to this little charge over here. Um, the signal is basically the same thing we use to set up the motors. It's a little piece of um, 
uh, explosive that shoots off a little explosion um, and it triggers a bigger explosion. Um, so as you can see from that beautiful little red cloud, um, it shoots out uh, basically a bunch of force. What you're doing is you're converting a bit of black powder into a pressure. Um, basically, you're just expanding, putting a lot of pressure in the bay, and that causes a separation. Um, so we'll go more into how the actual separation mechanic works itself, but just for, um, for the time being, just know that um, we would deploy the drogue at this point. Um, the drogue would fly out because of that charge, um, and the whole rocket would get separated. And then um, after a little bit, obviously, that drogue is basically the only force up, and the force that it's under is the exact same as the weight of the rocket um, at a certain point. You have an impulse on there from when it first deploys, because obviously, um, you have a big decrease in acceleration, or I guess increase in acceleration. But at a certain point, um, your acceleration will be zero, um, meaning your forces are equal. So your drogue will be under the same force that your whole rocket is under. Since it's the only upwards force, it'll be at the top. Everything will be kind of dangling down. So this is as we're kind of going from apogee to 500 feet or whenever we set our main to go off at. So yeah, and then this is what happens when we reach that altitude um, the main deploys at basically. Like I said, we told our we told our um, avionics bay exactly what 500 feet tastes like, and it's like, okay, we're finally here. So it shoots off another charge, um, another separation happens, the main deploys, um, and yeah. Then when we reach here, um, basically the drogue has much less force than the main. So usually the main becomes dominant um, in terms of the recovery of the rocket itself and the position of all the components. So this is generally how you'll see most of the rockets coming down when you're standing there on the field, if anyone came to the launch. Um, and you might be a little bit concerned about, about <laughs> yeah, basically it's inverted as you can see. Cool, right? Um, and another thing that could happen during this is your main can get tangled with drogue, which is part of the reason why we use these really long shock cords. Um, but yeah, we'll get more into that. So that's, that's the summary of the dual deployment setup. Um, this is the setup that um, IREC uses, I believe. Does IREC use dual deploy? Are they doing standard to standard? Both IREC, I believe. Yeah, so um, both IREC and SL are using this deployment. Um, but for the rockets that we're going to be developing for you guys, for the kind of L1s and the, the L1 sort of simulations we're going to be developing for the GEMs, um, they use something much simpler. So uh, this is your basic rocket, um, and then Imagine we're at Apogee. Um, and as you can see, there's no avionics bay here. Um, the smaller motors actually usually have um, black powder built into them. So how it works is the black powder starts burning. And then after a time, it'll reach some sort of clay, which kind of burns as well. Um, and it'll shoot out a little delay charge, basically. And then after that delay, it'll reach a bit of black powder at the end, and you'll get a little explosion. So you don't need an avionics bay for this. Um, so for this rocket, there was no um, sort of internal black powder charge in the motor, but for this one, there is. So you have to kind of look out for that when you're um, looking your motors. But um, yeah, basically the same idea, except you're deploying your main um, at this height. So we're deploying our main at Apogee. Um, and if you look back over here, this is, this is the difference in performance you'll get out of the two. So the red line is kind of deploying the main at Apogee. You get a lot more um, horizontal distance that you have to go. Um, it is common. It, it, you might think that um, that doesn't really matter, but <laughs> we do have a tendency of losing our rockets from them drifting to places we can't find. So it really is a is a pretty big deal um, the horizontal drift distance. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically what we're going for. Since the L ones usually go to a much lower distance, you have less time to drift, so it's not that big of a deal. But once you reach those bigger rockets, like the SL and the IREC one, if you don't do a drogue deploy first, you will never find your rocket again. Or you will have a very fun time finding it at the very least. Or it'll go into some swamp that we weren't supposed to reach or something. It's fun. Um, yeah, so that's the, the basic recap of what the separation events um, kind of look like. And that's, that's mostly the, the heart of avionics recovery, getting those ejection charges to go off. Um, and in a little bit, we'll talk about the um, electronics regarding that. But for a general summary, that's how it looks. Um, so what controls, 
Yeah. <laughs> I referenced you as Joel previously in the channel. Um, yeah, so, uh, by the way, anyone have any questions before we go on? Yeah, so um, if there's no avionics um, system in the rocket, such as your, your L1, if you, if you don't put um, some sort of altimeter in here, um, you won't know how high it goes. So the altimeter does the dual function of both deploying your ejection charges and recording your height. Um, sometimes in these L1 rockets, they'll use the motor's ejection charge, um, but they'll still have an altimeter in there. So they just don't put a black powder charge on the altimeter. You can do it either way. But yeah, good question. Yeah, so, so once you turn on the altimeter, um, it starts reading the barometric pressure. And then um, once it sees a big change of barometric pressure, it's like, okay, I'm flying. So that's when it starts recording. Um, and those are the, the beeps you'll hear on the field of the, the altimeter going off to tell us how high it went, basically. The barometer is what tastes in the air. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Any other questions? Do you have your audio on just in case? I, oh, I don't have my audio on. I'm sorry, were you guys talking to me? Oh, sorry, guys. Nobody could hear anything you guys said. <laughs> okay, nothing? Okay, cool. We'll go onwards. So um, what controls where separation occurs? So if you kind of, if we want to look back here, or this is probably a better image. Um, how do we control which coupler the separation is happening at? Because it could happen over here, or it could happen over here. Um, so what controls that? Basically, we have a system of either shear pins. Well, what we call shear pins. Technically, they're not shear pins, but um, it's what we call shear pins. Or uh, rivets, which are basically thicker than the shear pins. Um, and yeah, if you want to look at a little infographic, how this works. Um, Imagine those couplers, um, those green parts of the couplers, um, and the black marks in them are kind of the, uh, the shear pins versus the rivets. Um, so as your ejection goes off, um, you'll get a different amount of shearing force on each module. So if, if the ones on the right, for instance, are much thicker or made of a better material, such as some sort of steel, um, they won't shear off before the other ones shear off. So, what, Megan was there the whole time. <laughs> so, so basically, um, we kind of we can jangle it so that we always get the shear on the right one we want. So these are these would be our quote unquote shear pins, um, which are usually nylon screws. Um, so what happens is they literally shear off. Um, we literally break the the fastener in half. Um, and we need that faster in there to hold it together while it's flying, but we need it to also um, have enough, be weak enough so we can separate it once our ejection charge goes off. So if you've ever gone into any of the other channels or heard on the announcements like, oh, we're doing testing for ejection charges, what we're doing is we're fine tuning how much black powder we're using to get a proper ejection out um, because the, the number is, is kind of empirically um, obtained. But, yeah, so that's how we control where the separations are. Um, as for hardware, um, this is like basically the summary of all the hardware we ever use um, for it. Uh, sometimes we use more, sometimes we use less, but this is all the um, like most essential components. So you have your um, parachute here. Um, basically, we'll look up the specs for it. Um, we'll find a parachute that has a CD we want, um, all the stats we want, basically. Um, and you can use that in the basic like drag force equation to kind of find um, what parachute we need to get whatever performance out of it. Um, you have it's connected to a bunch of shroud lines. Basically, those control how open the parachute is. Um, they serve the dual function of also being a way of editing how big the parachute opens, which edits our drag characteristics. So if we buy a parachute that's too big by accident, um, one of the solutions we can always do is to reef those lines. So um, if you put basically a collar on one of those shroud lines and you move it up, you can edit, um, you can edit the amount of area that the, the parachutes open in. So that's like, that's one way of editing um, your drift radius and your graphic velocity. Um, 
Another fun little thing we use are these little D-links. Um, I'm sure you've seen them before. Um, basically what you do is you can move that screw on it and you can close it and open it. Um, you can make it wrench tight. So basically it's a way of making a permanent kind of metal connection. Um, well, not permanent, you can obviously take it off, but it won't come off in flight um, if you wrench tighten it. Um, and then you have these eye bolts here. Um, you saw last meeting, Joel kind of went over eye bolts and bulkheads and whatnot. Basically these guys um, are, go through a bulkhead and have a screw on the other side usually, screw it on, wrench tighten the screw, cover it in epoxy because we're crazy. Um, and then we interface the D-links with those eye bolts. Um, another thing is a shoot protector. If you've heard me mention, we use black powder a lot. Not all ejection systems use black powder, but for the ones that we usually do, they do. Um, so one problem you'll have is that um, the black powder is an explosion. Um, so it will cause um, burns on all of our shoots um, and it could damage the shoot to a point where it won't even open. Um, that was actually something we experienced at a point where the, the shoot kind of melded with itself um, because it wasn't properly covered and it caused one of our rockets to fail. Um, and not only that, it'll just leave kind of holes in the shoot. It's not something we want. So basically this is like a fire blanket um, that we kind of put the shoot in before we deploy it. Um, so this, this image is a little bit inaccurate because how it actually works is all that parachute stuff is within a burrito fold of that um, fire blanket. And then we set it up in such a way that once you get caught in that shock cord, which is the line holding it from the nose cone to the body, once that goes taut, um, it gets pulled out of that fire blanket. So yeah, um, back here. Um, like I said, shock cord, that's another component. Um, basically, um, the ejection charges cause a very big um, like instantaneous like force on this. Um, and it, it basically, you need a pretty hefty cord to make sure that when you pull it, when something separates because it's like a lot of mass and also the ejection charges are like pretty darn strong. So um, you basically just need a material strong enough to do that. And the shock cord is what tethers the different sections together. Usually we don't have separate sections flying off from the rest of the rocket. Usually everything is kind of connected in some way or another. Um, the swivel is the last fun component. Um, the best way to think of a swivel is that um, if you have like a, if you have like a cord like this and you kind of start spinning the top of it, you'll start to cause this to, to go in circles and kind of swivel around into a spiral. Um, think of the parachute doing that all the time. The parachute is constantly spinning at a very, very high velocity. Um, so how you decouple the motion of the, um, the parachute in the massive mass of the body of the rocket is basically the, the swivel allows um, one of the ends to rotate without respect to the other end. So the parachute can keep spinning and there's no sort of tangling that comes in the lines of the shroud lines, but your, um, your rocket can also spin independently of the parachute, which makes it so none of your shroud lines get tangled. Um, yeah, it's a little bit weird, but yeah. Um, I'm gonna do this slide first. So this is, uh, I don't know how this got out of order. It's kind of surprising. Boom. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay. Um, this is how the setup looks like when we have it fully made. Like I said, um, D-link on an eye bolt, usually attached to one side. Um, D-link on, on an eye bolt attached to the other side. Shock cord attached to that D-link. Um, and then in the middle, You'll have your full setup. You'll have your parachute protector. You'll have D-link. Um, usually you'll have multiple D-links. Um, the actual setup you can probably see um, in the lab or if you want to talk to Colin or um, our other avionics guy for IREC. Um, but yeah, so basically that connects. There's a D-link, usually a swivel on the D-link. You got your shroud lines, you got your parachute. Um, those are all of the most quote unquote essential components of any sort of parachute deployment. Um, and yeah, that's something that we will be seeing when we do your um, L1s and when we try to simulate your L1s on open rocket. It, one of the things we do would be to simulate all the masks for all these. Um, so yeah, fun. It's good to know. Good to know all these components. Um, so we're going to tag back to kind of the more complex design. 
so I keep saying um, all these things about you know breathing, breathing air, and all that, the barometric pressure, all that. Um, you're probably wondering how that actually looks for the avionics bay itself. Um, this is kind of a little bit of an older design for the avionics bay. Um, it's not the it's not fully supermodeled, but it has all of the essential components we need to kind of go through it. Um, so basically how it works is you got two bulkheads on either side um, and you have a threaded rod connecting it in the middle. Um, if you tighten the nuts on either side of those, so if you tighten this nut or this nut, um, you cause basically tension and it, you can close the bay. So one of the things we're always scared about is the ejection charges, like I said, are just a big explosion that has a bunch of really hot gas. It's very like sulfurous and, and will destroy any electronics. Um, so because of that tension we caused there, this usually doesn't let any ejection gas go through, which is useful because um, as you could, as you could probably, probably assume, since the avionics bay altimeters are reading pressure, if you have an influx of pressure caused by a black powder charge, you can not only break them, but you can mess up their data. So yeah, um, basically, um, like I said, you tighten these guys. This is where your D-link would go. So your D-link would go there, and then you'd wrap your Kevlar um, shock cord around here, and it'd go to wherever, parachute somewhere down the line, something like that. Um, so yeah, that's how that looks. And then um, we basically also have these switches here. Uh, one thing we're always scared about is having altimeters arm. Um, altimeters have this, um, this tendency to accidentally get pressurized and that will cause them to think they're in flight. And then once they think they're in flight, they're like, okay, time to blow up, I'm on the ground. Um, so one of the things we, we try to do to prevent this is to make sure we turn on our altimeters from the outside right before we launch. So we click those on, the altimeters are like, okay, I'm on, I'm ready to fly, I'm ready to fly. Um, when we do that, they're on the stand. So um, if they blow up, it's not good, but it won't kill someone or it won't hurt anyone. So that's why we have those little switches there. Um, these are just little uh, nine volts. Most of our altimeters use nine volts. Um, we have different attachment mechanisms for them, um, but yeah, it's not that important. Um, and then here are your little altimeters, uh, very simple devices. Basically they have little wires coming out that go, uh, sorry, I've just <laughs> little images all over it. Um, so basically they have little lines coming out. They come out of here. Um, so if this is a top view of the bulkhead, there's like a little hole right here that we lead wires out of. And then to try to prevent pressure from getting in there, we'll cover it in plumber's putty or like hop something to, to close off the hole, make sure no pressure gets in. Um, so those will be permanent wire connections. Those permanent wire connections go to terminals. So those are just like little electronic connectors. Um, they're not super complex. They're just literally uh, basically a linkage. And then two wires come out. Um, and on the end of those wires is a little explosion, explosion device. Um, and once that, be, once you get current in this line, once there's any current in this line, that thing, this guy blows up. So when that guy blows up, basically um, the whole sequence begins where um, we kind of get all the black powder to blow up. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's how that works from, from this side and then the top view of that. Not too complex. Uh, we can go more into it if um, if we end up doing like construction stuff, and we can show you physical copies of these components. Um, but yeah, that's that's the basic summary of how the projection stuff works. Any questions? <laughs> cool. <laughs> so. Um, just a, just a last little summary so everyone has a good idea of what this actually looks like. This is our avionics bay, and you can see kind of the coupler in it. So this is, uh, here we go. This is slightly less, this whole component right here, this guy, is slightly less of a diameter than the rest of the rocket. So that allows us to slip into the rocket. Uh, so it kind of looks like that. And then, hold on, hold on. 
Then the yellow is your body tube. Yeah. Um, so we can basically make it so the outside of the rocket is flush with this component right here. So this is what we call the switch band. Um, it's basically a piece of the body tube that we cut off and glue it onto the coupler. And because of that, um, it'll be flush with the rest of the body of the rocket. So super cool. Um, but yeah. And then, so for open rocket and bulk rotation, um, actually integrating um, all of your avionics and recovery stuff is super simple in open rocket. Um, basically you use the parachute component and what you do is you put in all your information. So you put in your diameter, which um, the manufacturer will give you. You put in your drag coefficient, which sometimes the manufacturer gives you. Um, so that's another fun one. That's something that avionics recovery does a lot. Um, finding the drag coefficient by throwing off um, the tube from the roof of a building and measuring how long it takes to come down and then using the drag force equations to try to find out what the CD is um, actually. So that's, that's a fun testing thing that they usually do. Um, you have these shroud lines, uh, which are, like I said earlier, those little lines on the ends. Um, and yeah, then basically you just put where it is and uh, open rocket is kind of stupid, so it doesn't even care about how you're doing your separation. It only cares about what the height of your separation is. So um, you don't even have to model like what the separation points are or anything. Open rocket will just say, oh, when I reach 200 meters, I'm just going to assume that this parachute is open. So that's good. Um, and it makes your life a lot easier when you're actually simulating this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, basic idea. Um, you put all that in, you override your weight, um, and then you set your deployment height and your parachute is ready to go. Uh, any questions? Any questions? So why is the standard deployment height for a drogue around 500 square feet? Oh, we'll get into that, Joel. <laughs> but first, I have, a, I have a quick quiz. <laughs> this high. deployment height, that red height, uh-huh is altitude. What type of deployment schematic do you think this follows? The complex or the simple design? So true, everyone, the simple design. <laughs> because if, if, if it was the complex design, you would see the altitude going down very quickly because we're under Grove. And then we would go to a main chute, which would drop it off like that. But yeah. Um, so our last couple little notes, which you're all probably going to need when you come up with your um, designs, is so here's just the basic, basic, super simple summary. Um, editing the CD on the parachutes and open rocket is very important. It's something that a lot of people skip, um, but it has a very, very, very drastic effect on your simulation. So make sure you change that CD number because it is not 0 0.8. It is very, very rarely 0 0.8, which is the default that it gives. Um, wind speed in the simulation, um, the simulation tab of your uh, open rocket is very important for finding drift radius. Um, open rocket will give you an estimated drift radius and it, it calculates that it's, it's a pretty simple calculation and it's something we, that we, you can hand calculate pretty easy. And we have a sheet in the drive that can calculate it. But basically you're multiplying the amount of time you're in the air by the wind speed. And you could use that to find your horizontal distance you go. Um, Another thing, um, shock cord. Everyone always wonders, how much shock cord do I use? Um, about two to three times the length of the rocket. Uh, you might be asking, where does that number come from? That number comes from experience. <laughs> um, basically, if it's not long enough, you are um, increasing the amount of force per unit um, length. Not only are you doing that, but you have a more of a chance of when you're um, kind of in the air, your rocket's components, as, they, as they're holding on to the parachute, they'll hit into each other and break each other in flight. So um, basically how you prevent that is having um, differential lengths of shock cord on either side. So um, one of the components of the rocket is always above the other. So if your nose cone and all your top section is over here, you want your, your, um, the bottom of your rocket to be like up here. So the, they're, when they're swinging, they're not hitting each other. Um, yeah, uh, so check what type of motor you have. Another fun tip, um, 
Sometimes people will pick out motors, um, assuming they have black powder charges, which is something that has happened to me in the past. Um, they'll pick out a motor, assume it has a black powder charge, and it doesn't have a black powder charge, and no charge ever deploys, and your um, parachute does not deploy because of that. Um, another fun tip, um, they might also have charges when you want when you don't want them to have charges. So um, you might have an early ejection or some sort of stresses caused on your vehicle. Um, and this is something you can look up. So it's super cool, super cool, interesting stuff. But, um, and then just numbers in general. Um, basically, uh, we need the main to deploy at least 500 feet above the ground, usually. That number is actually dependent on your, your max speed under drogue. So um, if you're going at 100 feet per second, um, and you're deploying at 500 feet, that means realistically you have five seconds to deploy your main, which is reduced by the fact that it takes second for it takes a couple of seconds for your main to, to cause that deceleration that you want. Um, so realistically, if you're going at 100 feet per second and you're deploying at 500 feet, you have about two to three seconds for your main to fully unfurl. unfurl. Um, and as you can tell, that's kind of scary. So um, usually you'd go higher than 500 feet or you have to be kind of careful what your um, speed under drug is. So yeah, um, usually max speed under drug, um, we try to limit it to under 100 feet per second. Um, some rockets fall down even faster than that, um, but usually we try to limit it below that. Um, our max speed under main, this stat um, also corresponds with uh, kind of what your I guess your ground hit velocity is. Ground hit velocity is very, um, very important stat to consider. Um, as you can see, <laughs> kinetic energy has velocity squared. So the more your velocity is, the more kinetic energy you're hitting with the ground. Um, and it basically exponentially makes your, your rocket more likely to, uh, to break. <laughs> so um, try to keep it under 20 feet per second. Um, if you can, under 17 feet per second is usually the industry standard, um, the, the random number that all the, the gray beards have decided on is 17 feet per second. 20 per, feet per second is probably fine though, um, but it depends on your construction quality. Um, if you have like fins that are made out of wood or something, you probably want to hit the ground with less velocity because your fins are the most likely thing to break. Um, but yeah, it's all dependent on that. Um, but those are, those are my final notes for um, the avionics system. If anyone has any, uh, any burning questions? What influences the coefficient of drag of a parachute? Are there different types of parachutes you can choose from? Oh, of course, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> the the coefficient of drag. Um, if you've ever seen the drag force equation, well, let's let's pull this let's pull this up. Drag force equation. Hopefully, nothing weird comes up. Please, please, please. Okay. Um, basically, it's this guy right here. Um, your drag force is uh, like I said earlier, when you are falling under no acceleration, otherwise known as your forces being equal to each other, this drag force equation will equal your mg of your rocket. So that CD basically um, basically affects what your velocity will end up being. So you have that velocity you have that velocity term there, and basically if you increase CD, your velocity will be your velocity will have to be less to meet that mg of this term over here. In other words, more CD equals you fall slower. So um, what affects that is the rockets or the parachutes construction. Um, some parachutes have big holes in the middle. Some parachutes don't have big holes in the middle. Um, uh, spill holes, they usually cause some sort of stability. So a lot of people like the spill holes. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how the, the parachute CD component works. Um, usually your manufacturer will give it to you. Other times you have to find it out using this, this same equation. Um, if you drop a known mass off a building, um, you have a known velocity because you can time how long it takes to fall down the building. You know the length, um, you know the area of the chute, you can, you can compute CD. Chat. Chat. Is, chat. There, is there a question in chat? Chat. It's fine. Oh my God. <laughs> Only one is. Oh, Why did everyone say simple? <laughs> what the fuck did I say earlier? Okay. Oh, like oh, they said. Oh, <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you answering that question. <laughs> okay, so with the more complex design, is there any advantage in putting the main parachute behind rather in the front of the bay? Um, I'm not sure. I, do you know what they mean by that? So in the, initially, you had like main in the aft section versus the forward. So is there any advan any advantage for the layout between having forward or between having either parachute and forward versus the aft section? Um, there is an advantage, and it comes from the the weights of your individual. Um, oh god, hold on. There's like this big zoom tab that's in the way. So let's return to here. So as you can see, kind of um, just just for clarity, um, I didn't switch the bays that we're on, but just just so that we're all on the same page of, of how the this charge works. As you can see, the main is attached to the, the upper section in this picture, and it's still attached to the upper section in this picture. Um, what this was supposed to simulate or show to you guys is that once the main opens and it fully unfurls, it will cause more drag force that causes the um, main to be at a higher elevation than the drogue. Just, just for full clarity about this picture. That aside, um, for your question specifically, um, it does matter. Um, basically, we usually try to keep the drogue in the lower section. Um, there's numerous reasons for this, but one of them is that the, um, the drogue section or the, the bottom section of the rocket is usually um, heavy compared to the top section. Um, it depends on your payload, but um, that can cause it to have a, a higher kinetic energy, which means that you want to um, kind of slow it down before you want to slow down the main section, I believe. Is that the right way of describing it, right? Kind of, yeah. Kind of, in a way. Basically, <laughs> basically, you could do either sections, but um, you definitely want to make sure that this section is slowed down um, prior. Um, basically, um, if this section, if it's connected to this section, it means that your if your main doesn't deploy, um, your nose cone will hit the ground first um, relative to this section hitting the ground first, um, if that makes any sense. So if we, I think this is the right way of describing it. <laughs> but. You, it, I mean, it depends on the design, but usually the fins are the most likely thing to get damaged, and they're also on the section that has more kinetic energy. So you want that like So yeah, if you deploy like this, your um your nose cone section will hit the ground first. So if we if we got stuck like this, and this main wasn't here. Um, because it never deployed, so this would be up here. You would want your um, nose cone to hit the ground first, I believe. I don't know if that's the right way of describing it, honestly. It also depends on where you're putting the patients on the line. Yeah. That's the next question. And then the which one's the longer? Usually, we um, try to vary the shock cords between one of them being um, two times as long as the other, or not two times as long, one of them being two times the length of the rocket and one being three times the length of the rocket. Um, so um, doing that, you can cause it to have the um, distance between the components being different. Um, I'm not sure if it exactly matters um, which of them is two times or not, but I would assume that if you wanted to do it the super, the super empirically correct way, or not empirically correct, just scientifically correct way, you would want it to be so that the larger component, which would be the or the back end of the of the rocket, since it usually weighs more, you'd want that to be connected to the longer length. And because it's connected to the longer length, that allows you to um, have, I guess, um, more kinetic energy withheld by the shroud line or by the shock cord. But that would also cause your um, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why they put the um, the parachute in the front because if you if you follow that line of logic, I'm not sure it would cause the um, it would cause the bottom section to hit the ground first, right? I know there's a rule of thumb, but I don't. You know, just they're just standard. But that standard 
from what I've recalled over the years, doesn't have any like specific reasoning other than it's the standard. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure there's some sort of reason. I'm sure there's some sort of reason the drug is usually in the bottom half, but I'm not 100 percent sure. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry, James. <laughs> is there any other questions? Any questions? Can you do the last slide real quick? You can ask your question. I just wanted to see the last slide. Okay. Um, so if you're not using, if you don't have like CV, like you don't use that to determine which like what parachute to get, how do you know what parachute you so um, when you're in, um, so you you don't know what CD you have? Like, because you said that sometimes the manufacturer doesn't specify what it is. You have to test for it when you physically have it. Yeah, so usually um, when we buy, we go directly for manufacturers that have CD picked. Okay. Um, otherwise, you kind of have to just guess and check it um, <laughs> because you'd, ha you'd have to buy it and then figure it out what it is. Um, also, usually certain designs for parachutes will have the same CD as each other. Um, there's different designs for parachutes. Some of them have big scope holes in the center, some of them don't. Um, and these differing factors can cause your CD to be kind of the same. If one design looks like another, but it's just scaled up. Um, but aside from that, usually your manufacturer will give it to you. Um, but um, usually the CD that they give to you also won't be correct. So <laughs> once you test it, um, you figure it out. Um, usually you try to go for a little bit more than what you need. So um, if you're trying to aim for 17 feet per second ground hit velocity, um, you'll aim for 15 feet from your, from your parachute that the manufacturer gives you. So you put in their specs, you go for 15 feet per second on your open rocket. And then if you need to change that number, you can reef the shroud lines to cause you to save more. So you can always you can always decrease the amount of openness the parachute does, but you can't always increase it. So you usually overshoot. But yeah. 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 Parachute manufacturers like to overestimate how efficient their parachutes are. This is true. They're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're fucking the liars. <laughs> they say that they're very good when in reality they are at best like a little bit worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So the parachute that you use for it is going to be dependent on um, what your design is, how heavy your rocket is, um, which is dependent on other factors such as how long your rocket is. Um, but like, yeah. generally when they do make parachutes, they're always in standard sizes. So it'll be like one foot, two foot, three foot, four foot, and then it'll like scale up. So. There's not, it, and then just the perfect manufacturer will always give you that too. So you're always just buying these commercial off the shelf. Yeah, you can also make your own. This is, <laughs> you, you, you can, I have made parachutes. Some schools do, like some schools will make them each year and, and you'll save like a decent amount of money doing that too. It's just, it's just knitting. I mean, in the, in the end, it's just a, it's just a, a usually a hexagon with little lines attached to the end of it. It's not a complex thing to make, which is, Maybe a fun side project or something. I don't know. Hey, throwing out some ideas. <laughs> um, yeah. Did you have any other questions, Joel? Because you wanted to go to the last slide. I think the, the question was more or less on like, where on the shop floor design you put the parachutes. Is that a thing? Do you put them one third, two thirds in the middle? Um, usually I go for the middle, although I know some some people argue that you should go um, not in the middle so um you can kind of do the math on it and it's based on how deep your um your parachute is into the bay um and this is another thing that kind of goes along with the um trying to make sure your sections are a different length across you can or like a different vertical height when it's falling so you can do the math where you figure out where to put your parachute based on trying to keep them separated in the air um and there's other things to consider as well, such as how much of your shock cord is actually inside the rocket. So that that length is basically wasted length. So if you wanted to go in the exact middle of the um, of the deployment, you actually wouldn't want to put it in the exact middle of the line, because the exact middle of the deployment is going to be slightly shifted over because a lot of the line is inside of the body tube still. Um, if it has like a long section between the um, the eye bolts and the exit of the rocket, so 
Yeah. Where the okay, so is your your question is what what determines how deep your eyeball is in? Um, usually that's that's a factor that outside of avionics and coverage or light control. So usually that'll be a design factor built by someone else. Um, so they'll be like, oh, my payload wants to be in this part of the rocket. Um, but usually, usually their 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 requirement for that derives from your requirement as well. So it's a fun system because um, the parachute and all the shock cord takes up a lot of room. So you're using a lot of that bay um, for your shock cord and your parachute. So, um, so yeah, it's kind of up to you and up to them where they want to put that eyeball. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> um, any other questions? If there's no other questions, we can go into the future of GEMs with our Joel. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure Joel has a plan. <laughs> um, so by now, we assume that you can do everything, obviously, right? Okay, so um, <laughs> you, you should have a very rough framework of the components for rock because uh, the lectures, the lectures, the gems were mainly about flight dynamics, structures, and avionics recovery. So from those open rocket files, you should understand like how design of a rocket works in terms of what materials you want and then how you want to fit those materials. Because last week in structures, we're talking about how your airframe can be different sizes. Those sizes will depend on what you're putting inside of it for your parachutes, right? And then it also depend on what kind of motor you're putting in there, what kind of fins you're using. Motors and fins are flight dynamics and those will influence everything else. So like between the three gems, you should have a reasonable understanding of like how everything fits together. So my goal for the remaining like semester, the rest of the semester and the rest of these gems are that you all will start to design your own level one rocket. So you all are going to design a rocket that has like a certain length, it has one parachute because you're going for single deploy and then it'll use a level one motor so from there, like it's up to you guys to do your own research on types of airframes for like a three-inch rocket, types of motors that are required for a level one cert. So that would require you to go on the NAR website to do just research high-powered rocketry and then start doing sims of your parachute testing. So ideally, that's what we'd do for the next two weeks. So then when we do come back from spring break, hopefully everybody's design will be like pretty much hashed out. Everybody has a rocket. That rocket can be designed, can be built with COTS. And then after spring break, we just start building it. And then hopefully we have it ready for launch in April. So I guess in that sense, you guys are just going to have to have your little homework of starting to design your rocket. And then we'll probably meet once a week again, just on these Thursday meetings. And these will be like your office hours for, hey, I designed this rocket. Does it work? Does my parachutes make sense? Um, does this flight profile going this high ground hit, just a design of payload, parachute, motor, do these all make sense? And then, yeah, once we come back from spring break, we'll start like working out how we're gonna buy those components, how we're gonna start manufacturing. And then when manufacturing comes, getting safety trained, doing your own testing, and then just preparing for launch, making sure that we're up to date with Jimmy, who is our uh, Tripoli and NAR advisor. Yeah. So basically next steps, um, like Jill said, uh, you guys have learned at least a little bit about Open Rocket. Um, it is basically a big playground for you guys to kind of go into. Um, me, Joel, Bilal, um, all of the gym people know a lot about Open Rocket. Um, you can also talk to the flight dynamics people. I'm sure they'd help you as well. Um, so if you have any questions along the way, we can obviously help you. Um, and a lot of the components such as trying to find out um, what the packed length of a parachute is, for instance. Um, the websites might tell you, um, the internet might tell you, but if you can't find it, um, you can always talk to us and we could probably find out a solution for you or maybe even help you, you test it in hand because we have all these parachute sizes in hand. So if you need to test something like that, um, we're always open to it. Um, but yeah, for, for now, um, make those open rocket simulations if you can within the next two weeks. Um, our DMs are open, me, Joel, Lal, um, Alex. Uh, we're all ready to uh, 
help you guys. And then once we're done with that, we will get to building and getting our L1 starts. It'll be super fun. Yeah. Any other questions? Questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if not, next next meeting will just be a little office hours. If you guys have questions about your designs, I will reserve a room or I'll just post it to Zoom again and then yeah, I'll just be here. Yeah, we'll try to come out with a basic spec list of what motors we have, right? And what airframes um, we have for you guys to work with. Um, and using those, you can derive most of the other components of the rocket because um, they, they have a big influence on what you, you can use. Some important dates, though, it hasn't been officially announced, but it is going to happen. We will be launching March 19th. That is the third Saturday. It hasn't been announced yet because you don't know what field we're launching at. It will either be at Camp City, which is where we are at last week or two weeks ago. It will either be there or it will be on the Space Coast. So it's just the difference between two hour or three hours drive. So look out for that one. And then so that's March. We will also be launching again in April for sure. At, least, at the very least, IREP will be launching in April, which is also on the third Saturday. So we got two more chances to launch a rocket. And April will also be the CERT launches for those who are in the news. Hey, by the way, I just remembered why you put the drogue at the back. It's because the drogue weighs less. <laughs> it's, you put the drogue in the bottom of the rocket because it weighs less than the main. So you're increasing your stability if you put the main in the front. Sorry, I had to think about it. <laughs> it took me 30 minutes. <laughs> That's the reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, whatever Joel said. <laughs> so true. Um, so, so the, the mass of your rocket, um, if you go back to, I think it was Bilal's lecture. Um, yeah. So, um, you're basically when you increase your fin size, it moves this down. So this is your, your CP, which basically it's the center of pressure, so the center of where all your aerodynamic forces are. So if you make your fins like massive, your CD will go or your CP will go through. And then um, your CP is this guy. So he's the center of every single mass in your rocket. So you want him to be over here and you want him to be down here, generally. You want there to be a distance here between them. It's a price isn't sharing the screen. Sorry. I can't open rocket up. Sorry. You want <laughs> you're not sharing screen, Bryce. Oh, you're stuck on Windows. Oh, I'm so sorry, everyone. My bad. I've been, I showed this rocket like multiple times. Did you? I think so. I was watching this now. Thank you. Okay, anyways, you want this, this CP component to be higher up in the rocket, and you want this. It's not, not tracking. It's not tracking? <laughs> Damn it. Man, I don't know how these, how you guys on Zoom even understood anything I've been saying, because I've been doing mouse motions everywhere, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> <laughs> you want, you want your, I'm sorry, everyone. You want your you want your CG component to be higher up in the rocket. So usually you want to have your mass for your main parachute up here. Um, and you want to usually have your payload up here because your payload is usually pretty heavy. So you want it to try to be at the front of the rocket. Um, and then you want your CP your CP to be lower in the rocket. So that's the that's where all your aerodynamic forces are happening. So it's mostly affected by your fins. So if you make massive fins, you'll move your CP down. But if you make them too massive, you'll move your CG down as well. So you have to be careful about that. And also, if your fins are too big, they'll break off very easily. So <laughs> we'll talk more about that when you guys come up with your design. But basically, think of fins as a big cantilever beam. Um, so be careful about making them too big. But be careful about making them too small, or you won't be stable. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh. Good luck. Good luck. You've got this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Artos. <laughs> Sorry, what was your question, Lisa? Oh, um, uh, what's the payload for the L1 rocket? There's no payload for the L1 rocket. Yeah. Do we attach altimeters into the nose? On L1s, no. We currently don't have enough to do that. But if you wanted to buy one, that's generally how it would work. Like 100 bucks. The problem with altimeters isn't buying them, like money wise, it's that they. <laughs> they're never in stock. <laughs> uh, and like another issue with like altimeters are that they're very finicky. So like you can't necessarily just put
put it on like the shop court or somewhere in the rock, especially with an L1, because it's kind of hard to find out where you're going. Yeah, the, the altimeters, it might not have been super apparent from all my um, ugly, ugly CADs and, and saying that they're um, breathing air, but um, <laughs> basically they're, they're little, yeah, they're, they're like little electronics boards. So they're very fragile. So if you were to like use your L1 rocket and put an altimeter in there, it would most likely break. So you usually have to have some sort of dedicated bay for it. You need to be protected from like ejection charge gases because like you said, those gases are essentially just black powder and they're very costly. So if they get under your electronics, they will short them. Yeah. And just cause rust. Yeah. So you have to be very careful about placing these. There's some designs out there that are like made to be put in in like next to black powder charges. Um, but those are always out of stock. So don't even don't even consider them, honestly. <laughs> Usually you'll have to have a dedicated bay for it. Um, which is something you could design for your L1 if you really wanted to, but it would make your design more complex and not really add anything. But if you want to do it, I'm down to help you to do it. And there's two yeah, so usually um, for the altimeter setup, um, if you remember me mentioning earlier, the complex design has a much more high chance of failure. Um, so one of the things we do to try to prevent that is adding two altimeters. So if you have two altimeters, you could use one as redundancy. And basically your altimeters you have two altimeters, you have two separation events, but you have four different charges. So your four different charges, um, you'll have a charge at say apogee, and then you'll have another charge set to being apogee minus like 50 feet. Um, and then if both of, if one of those charges doesn't work, the second charge hopefully will work. And if the second charge doesn't work, you're fucked. <laughs> so, so you could theoretically add like three altimeters if you really wanted to go crazy, but um, They'll generally yeah. fail in the sense that either like it just reads data wrong or it doesn't cause a separation. So the way you fix the second one, the second event is, or I guess the way you fix the first one is you have two, right? So that's your redundancy. The way you fix it not separating is the second charge is significantly larger than the first one. Yeah, usually the second charge is stepped up 25% to make sure separation happens. Um, so yeah. But Generally, on an L1, L2, or at least on the L2, we don't generally put redundant altimeters because it is not a very big concern. Yeah, on your L1, um, you're you're searching for, you only have this motor for your ejection charge. So usually, you could do an altimeter design where you don't use that, but I don't think we even have the motors for that. Um, and also it makes your design more complex, um, which is not something we're really going for right now. Um, but yeah, since you only have one ejection here, you have to make sure that your ejection is strong enough to, to, um, to actually push everything out. Usually the motors go way overboard with their black powder amount stuff. So it shouldn't be that big of an issue, but yeah. Another thing I've noticed while you're in level one rocket might not have a way of measuring the altitude, there are very um, rudimentary ways of determining that. So one way is with one way is with your eyesight. So, <laughs> so, so what you have is you know the rocket is directly level with your eyes. When it goes up, you have an angle. So then you do some quick maths, you get that angle. So then you do okay, the rocket is roughly 200 feet away. It's at an angle of 85 degrees. You do your Sokotoa, you can find out the height. So there are tools. There's a, there's a there's like these little guns there's that are like angle guns. So essentially a way of you hold it vertically, then you point it up and you stop when it goes up. Yeah. And then um, like another way you could do it is you just do it with timing. So okay, rocket went up for 10 seconds, parachute deployed. So if you do like the quick maths on it, you say 10 seconds deployed. You know the you know the math for drogue and main, so you just reverse the ride how long it's floating for. Is it like the like the No, you just do um okay. It was under drogue for this long. We know that it has a mass of this, so falling under drogue it falls for twenty feet per second. Oh, no, it falls hundred feet per second for ten seconds. It okay. falls under main for um five seconds. So you have that math you added up. You have your distance. Yep. So that's very rudimentary, so much air, but that's how you can 
derive it <laughs> without electronics. To be fair, the altimeters themselves have a lot of error too. Like the the usually when we put in two altimeters, they'll still be off by like about a hundred feet of each other. So who who even knows how how accurate they really are? Um, but yeah. <laughs> Anything else, anyone? Questions about the future, about the future of GEMs or Open Rocket? Is there anything you guys would like us to talk about specifically, like to just go more in depth on? Yeah. I feel like I would like to know, like, I know what's happening. Oh, so you watched mine. I'm happy. Mine was last week, right? For you? No. See, there was actually four of them. You didn't watch the first three. <laughs> Let's clarify. <laughs> Intro. <laughs> I don't could we could say. actually tell, talk about like what kind of material, material we have in stock. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll go into a list of that later, right? Well, yeah. I don't know oh, off the top of my head. Yeah, we'll have to find out, but we'll release that probably sometime. Yeah, we can we can go more in depth on Open Rocket. Um, just as a fair warning, we, I don't have this room anymore, but nobody's kicked us out yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, just in case, like, some, we just have to stop because someone comes. Yeah, I'm I'm free. I don't know if I can do a full Open Rocket tutorial right now. We honestly probably should have had a day dedicated to Open Rocket entirely. There's no rush right now. Yeah, but um. Yeah, I can go over the, the very, very basics in a 10 minute format right here. So basically open rocket, super simple. Um, you start at these up down component or your these top components. Um, what you can do is you can override the mass of everything. This is a sub component of it. Um, you can override the center of gravity. So once you actually get your rocket components and know how much they weigh and where the center of gravity is, which you do by putting your finger under it and trying to test where it falls, so if it falls here, you know your center of gravity is there. Or if it balances here, you know that your center of gravity is right here. Um, so, so you could do that. Um, and then all the other parts are, if you look over um, most of probably Joel's lectures would be best for this, um, structures, you can find out why they put all these components in different places. But um, the basic idea for most components is that um, you could set a length, you could set a diameter, an inner diameter, um, and your wall thickness is usually derived from that. Um, you find these specs online um, and you make sure they're correct from online because if you're off by a little bit on this outer diameter or your inner diameter, your mass and properties of your rocket will be really off. Another thing we do is um, if we know the uh, mass per, per inch of a certain piece of tubing, which we probably will know, we can just override the mass and everything of it um, right then and there. Um, you can set your material, um, you can set your component finish. Um, even if we paint it, we're horrible at painting. Um, you should probably set it as an unfinished paint or regular paint, and you can set that for all components. Um, and yeah, aside from that, you can set uh, launch lugs. We haven't really talked about how you interface with the, um, with the launch stand itself, but basically, um, if you've ever seen a piece of 8020, just consider a little mount that kind of interfaces with a piece of 8020. It's like a little, let me see if we can find a picture. Um, what are these called, real buttons? I agree, I'd be wanting to have open rocket on during my meeting. And you're also not playing screen. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, man. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> oh. They like these things. So basically, these can fit in this shaft here. And you see, um, basically, that provides us with stability off the pad. Um, you'll see when you go into the flight simulation tab of Open Rocket, it'll tell you your launch, your launch rail um, length. So that's important because um, you basically have to be going off your pad fast enough um, to be able to start your flight stable with a, enough velocity to like get a good, get a good runoff. Um, but yeah, basically. These little guys are on the side. Um, you can simulate them using um, launch lugs. Um, there's honestly so many things to go into with Open Rocket. I don't think I could do it in, in 10 minutes like I originally planned to do. <laughs> but, but, um, but yeah, I'm definitely down to talk at most times. 
well, not at most times, but if you if you, if you send me a when to meet, um, if you send me a when to meet that has like multiple days on it and multiple times, I can I can help anyone who needs needs help. But for the most part, it's just a big playground. You play around with it. Um, if you need help, um, we have not only the student launch rocket, which I guess we could probably send to everyone, right? Yeah. Yeah. We can send that to everyone, and then there's also a bunch of little um, example rockets. So this is actually an example rocket that we're on right now. We're on this one, um, but there's other things like you do a clustered rocket. These are rockets that have like multiple motors in them. We're not going to be doing those probably, but they're an option. Um, oh yeah, the nose cone is super. There's different types of nose cones as well. That's one component you can't really mess with. Um, so, whoa, this is the, this is the fin design they won't let me do <laughs> with the, and the tail cone they also won't let me do. <laughs> well, you guys didn't want to do the tail cone. Yeah, it doesn't go enough mock. Speed. It doesn't go enough mock. <laughs> what mock does this go to? Like, Look, this goes mock 0.27. This guy's there. Respect. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> Respect. As an aside, a tail cone, if you've taken oh, combo, we a tail cone is uh, the least alive because what you have is a converging diverging nozzle. So if you think about uh, it, I remember, I remember so if you think fun. about it on uh, like a hose of water, right? You have a hose of water. When you put your thumb on the end, you converge the nozzle. So it speeds up the water coming out of the hose. So what he's aiming for with a rocket having a converging nozzle is you increase the mass flow, or you increase the velocity of the flow out because you have conservation of mass, which says mass flow in equals mass flow out. <laughs> so you decrease the area, you have more speed outside. It doesn't matter at such a low speed because you don't have compressibility. So essentially what he's saying is when you're at, what I'm saying at a low speed is you have a giant hose, right? You put your thumb over it. Your thumb doesn't matter when it's a giant hose because it's not converging it enough to make a difference. Fucking arrow students <laughs> don't understand shit. Don't understand shit. He's saying. A tail cone is useful at lower speeds. Is just for looks. What is tail cone like? It's a so his his um the tail of his rocket tapers off at the end. It was the other design, but it it, it went from this to like that at the very end. Although there's like for the converging nozzle. So it's a converging nozzle is what a tail cone is. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, it's like um how on afterburners on a jet it goes like this, right? That's what they're doing. They're doing. They're controlling their CD nozzle. Mm -hmm. So true. It's very interesting, and like that you can see it on designs of a lot of rockets, which is why they can control it. It doesn't matter um for us because we have solid rockets that can only output at one speed, and because the increase or whatever is like very negligible. It does matter for solid rockets because that's the only way. Heads up about solid rockets, everyone. The only way you can edit a solid rocket, when it starts burning, it does not stop burning. And you also cannot control the burn at all. So the only way you can edit how strong it is um, or a lot of characteristics of it is things that Joel, Joel is talking about. Editing um, that size of the taper at the end, um, editing nozzle size in real time. Some, those are some of the only ways you can actually control a solid uh, motor. So. And they're very difficult if you want to do it real time. Yeah, it's difficult. Especially for a small rocket because you're trying to fit like all, all the super like complicated math and control mechanisms in a rather small tight area. Mm -hmm. um, just a heads up for you guys doing um, open rocket, um, be very careful about your nose cones. Make sure you get the right specs for them because um, these affect your, your CD a lot. Uh, yeah, your coefficient of drag for the overall rocket a lot. And also, um, we can't make any size of nose cone. Um, all the nose cones we have are off the shelf. So they'll have the specs for these. Um, don't just go in here and start being like, oh, I want my nose cone to be 16 inches long. Because <laughs> we're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to do that. <laughs> Unless you're like injection molding or something, I don't know, or 3D printing. You can also 3D print a nose cone. Heads up. If you want to try to do that, that'd be fun. But, um, but yeah, unless, unless you're planning on going through that hell, um, Make sure you're make sure you're getting it off the shelf nose cone. Just a heads up. But yeah. Anything else from anyone anywhere? Can I go to the fly? Can I what? I can go to the fly. 
Yeah, which slide? It's like one slide reminds me of the first day of the Ionic meeting, just came in and like, where's the other stupid? This is like to find another one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> it was like this, this thing. Oh, this is stupid. <laughs> oh, I hate threaded. Yeah, no, I hate threaded rods. There's a, I have a design. Well, I had a design for a different. I mean, this uh, is kind of like, I don't, I'm wondering if there's like a new design. I, think I, I don't even know if I still have it. Oh, yeah. Here. It's from a different PowerPoint. Basically, <laughs> we don't know the veracity of this design because it kind of, got destroyed in the first flight <laughs> but um but yeah basically you, you don't have to use threaded rods but it's way easier to use threaded rods uh, these were like a bunch of fiberglass sheets that were put onto a uh, 3d printed body that had little um passages through the middle to allow wires to go through um and yeah it had different layers for different things like you could put you could put like a payload you could put a payload in here if you really wanted to um here was all of our altimeters and stuff and our switch band all of our batteries were up here and the fun thing was that the wires of these batteries could go through this back shell um how, how, how did you connect the to the they had um they had screws that were put into shear so we we had little holes here basically um and screws going into them with threaded inserts so you can see them right here actually there. So is the bulkhead like PVC? Uh, the bulkhead was PVC. If you're curious about the style of the, oh, the mechanism, you can Google them. They're called set screws. Yeah. So they're like you need to put on the table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> set screws are usually used for motors in a scenario where you want to hide the head. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Me and you, Jared. I got. I got.